Hey folks, Gary here with Paramount. So I wanted to make a follow-up video and I think this is gonna turn into a video series on the MOA Sucks video. Um, I actually want to do some additional videos on this, actually filming through an optic and kind of uh, illustrating some of these things, and demonstrating some of these things in real time. And I also wanna address uh, the majority of the most common comments. And I'm doing that for two reasons. Number one, I really think that most of those uh, arguments are based on misconception and myth. Uh, or, or misunderstanding. And with that, I also want to show people, or I want to, I want people to see all sides of this argument. So I'm going to post some of those comments and that's not to say, oh, you know, this, you know, how no, people normally post comments to kind of uh, make fun of them. That's not it at all. I want to actually make sure that their voices are heard and their arguments are made and that I can address those directly. So this is done in, in the best of intentions uh, with no ill will or anything like that. But I do think that it's very clear that most of the arguments being made for MOA uh, are based on absolute misunderstandings or misconceptions of, of what I thought was kind of universally understood when it comes to long range principles. So let's get right into this. All right, so here we are, MOA sucks part two. And I wanna make sure that people understand my intent behind this, this video series to begin with, or the original video at least, was it's for new shooters and the undecided. All right, it's for those guys that are out there that are you know Googling or looking through YouTube, mill versus MOA. Um, and that's what it's for. I am not in any way trying to get you to switch from MOA. If you're heavily invested in MOA, both from a time and money perspective, uh, training, if you like it, if it works for you, um, then keep using MOA. It's, it's fine. Now, I do think, you know, everybody out there, including myself, everybody that's ever touched a long range gun has shot a video on mill versus MOA. Uh, but I think it, we'd be remiss or it's irresponsible because even I have said it in some videos and different things, you know, there's no real difference between MOA and mill. I don't believe that. And if you're using one or the other, you don't believe that. You think one is superior than the other and it's okay to say that and it's okay to make the case for that. If you think MOA is better, man, get out there, shoot a video and make a case for it. Um, so, you know, that's what this is about. I think there are very clear advantages of mill over MOA. Uh, and look, I am not, tied to either one. You know, at the end of the day, I started off shooting MOA and over the years using both, I know both systems, I can use both systems well. Um, but I think, again, just from experience, both from my personal experience and also watching lots of shooters come through our courses, the, most of the mistakes, most of the confusion comes from MOA. And that is who these videos are for. You know, if you're a brand new shooter and you're trying to decide which one to invest in, I want to make the case that people should invest in mill. And I think there's a really good argument for that. And I'm going to address some of your arguments against that very shortly. All of the arguments against mill are some version of these two right here. Number one, they're different, but equal. There's no real difference. They do the same thing. They get the job done. I disagree with that, obviously. And number two, the other one I keep seeing a lot, which is 100% based on misconception is MOA is more precise. And I will explain that and illustrate that in further detail. So the first argument that we hear on this is, you know, they're basically the same. They're just two, two different languages, right? But they do the exact same thing. Um, and I will tell you, most of the people making this argument have only used MOA or at least haven't used mill enough to see the difference. The other people making this argument are coming from a perspective where you know they don't shoot in situations where there is a perceptible or meaningful difference. And again, if that's you and you don't see any advantage to mill, again, that's fine. Keep shooting MOA. If it works for you, keep it up. All right, and now I'm gonna post some comments and what I try to do is go through and find the comments that best articulated the argument. So that there again, people watching this can hear both sides of the argument and they can juice for themselves. So right here is a very typical experience of someone that started off shooting MOA and ended up switching to mill. Here we have this gentleman, he said, I recently bought a new scope, which I paid decent money for. And being an MOA guy, I had to make the decision if I wanted to stick to that language or learn mills instead. I ended up going with mills because my shooting partner uses mills and I'm so glad I switched. Speaking and working in tents was much easier than I expected and I will never go back to MOA. Also, like you mentioned, if you use your reticle correctly and measure your misses, you don't need to relearn mills. It's a non-issue. And folks, that's the thing. Like, if you've only shot MOA and you haven't shot mills and, and got some experience behind it, like, how are you to even say which one is better? And that was my experience. I started shooting MOA, started shooting mills, and 
you know, I, it, the, it's clear to me which one's easier. Like the, 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 the mill industry isn't paying me. I'm not some mill shill. We need to make a patch of that mill shill. All right. Here's another guy that disagrees with me. And this was, again, was a very kind of encapsulated most of the comments that uh, made this, this kind of reference that there's really no difference. I do appreciate your effort trying to explain the advantage of mills, but I can see no difference. In ease or difficulty in holding off on either of the systems, if you or your spotter see the impact or just hold whatever lines left and whatever lines low, how can one be more difficult? Like variable ability and scopes, this is a brilliant marketing move to get some people to buy scopes again. Um, you know, again, he's saying, I don't really see the difference. And here's my response. When you have no time limits and you're shooting a single target, I don't disagree with you. Doesn't matter what you use, but it becomes very self-evident, which is easier and one would say better the moment you have people shooting multiple targets at multiple ranges, regardless if you're dialing or holding. The difference in mistakes or the likelihood of making a mistake and miss due to incorrect holds or incorrect dials becomes very obvious. And I gave the example of shooting three different targets. It's significantly easier to remember, find and hold 6.8, 5.2 and 8.2 than it is 23.75, 18.25, and 28.75. The same goes for dialing. I mean, if you never do anything to test practical ease of use and just shoot sitting on a bench, shooting one target at a time, of course, from your perception, there's no advantage of one over the other. It's like saying there's no difference in the performance of a Ford Mustang and a Ferrari based on that you've only driven them both 35 miles an hour in a subdivision. So, you know, my argument here is it's impossible to know if one is easier than the other, A, if you've never tried both, but number two, if you've never tested in, in any way to quantify that. You know, shooting slow aim fire with either system, it really doesn't determine anything. Application under time and stress determine which one is easier or simpler. Because under stress and then juggling multiple targets, that's where the mistakes are gonna happen. And anything more complicated, and my argument is definitely MOA is more complicated, uh, is going to take away from that. I mean, the whole purpose be behind training folks is that we're trying to we're trying to free up bandwidth, and so that we can apply the shooting principles, the 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 physical act of shooting, right? So the more that we're thinking about, more math we're having to do or anything like that. Now, some of that may be nuance, it may be very slight, but it starts to add up and makes a huge difference. You know, for instance, the difference between a two second draw and a one second draw is very minimal, but those things could be the difference between life or death. But generally speaking, we are shooting to become more efficient. And if one system is even slightly more efficient or easier to learn, I think it only makes sense to gravitate toward that. Um, and again, using the example I used before, my argument is it's reasonable to assume that when shooting three targets, it'd be less confusing and less prone to mistakes if you hold what I talked about earlier. And, and I think, again, you know, to objectively say one is easier than the other, you, and to quantify that, folks, you got to test that, right? So if we took 10 shooters, and I haven't done this, but I think it's reasonable to assume that if we took 10 shooters and gave them each three targets, and then we had them shoot it in mill, we had it shoot it MOA, and redid that test 10 times, I think we would see a lot more mistakes. And I personally have seen that when I'm training students and even guys and girls that are familiar with MOA, it's easy to dial 26 instead of 28. Um, the mistakes are just easier to make with MOA. And this right here, folks, I think is one of the best arguments for mill because I hear the argument a lot, hey, you know what, people are using mills because that's what everybody else is using. Well, that obviously wasn't always the case. You know, it's hard to argue against the fact that 20 years ago here in the United States, 90% plus of shooters used MOA, and now a large majority of shooters use MIL. The, they're shooting what everyone else shoots argument falls flat. And the fact that we used to have 90% of shooters shooting MOA, and now we have probably 90 plus percent shooting MIL in a very short time span, that is not insignificant. Because that result came about through side-by-side -side experience and comparison, and in spite of overwhelming popularity of one system over the other. So, you know, we started off with at least a couple of generations of shooters that probably started on MOA, but have all gradually moved toward mill. And we're seeing more and more mill shooters and less MOA shooters, and that is not because both systems are equal. I, I, I think that just doesn't make sense to me. And here we go. And besides the larger point, there's also dozens of more nuanced advantages of mill over MOA. 
Uh, the Creedmoor hack, for instance. So if you're not aware of the Creedmoor hack, if you're shooting 6.5 Creedmoor, the Creedmoor hack basically states you can take your range and hole, so for instance, 850 yards. That's 8.5. All you need to do is subtract two, you got 6.5. So now 6.5 is your elevation. And folks, that works really well on all 6.5 Creedmoor guns. 99% of them, that is gonna be your dope within a tenth of a mil. But you, there's nothing really comparable versus MOA. There's lots of, and same thing with wind calls. You know, with uh, mill, you can use your gun number for wind corrections, and that's a whole nother class we can do. But, you know, when you start looking at wind formulas for MOA, they get pretty complicated and convoluted real quick. So, and folks, there's lots of other small advantages for shooting mill over MOA like that, that really start to add up and make the case against MOA that much greater. All right, so this is, this is the one I definitely want to address. MOA is more precise. All right, bear with me on this one. So, you know, this gentleman, and I saw this on several different comments, I'm with you on Mills, but you know, F-Class. Folks, and here's my response to that. F-Class shooters do typically use MOA, but there are even exceptions to that. That being said, F-Class shooters are the most specialized and smallest minority in the shooting community. Folks, are you shooting .125 MOA groups? Um, is your gun 65 pounds? This goes for bench rest and F-class shooters. You know, I think there's a great case to be made for F-class shooters and uh, bench rest shooters to use MOA uh, because, well, well, we'll get into that in just a second. All right, uh, this gentleman said, coarser adjustments are cool, but if you're shooting four inch wide steel plates like you guys are shooting, but if you're shooting eight and a half by 11 inch pieces of paper at distance or shooting for group size, eighth MOA scopes or even quarter MOA is better. Folks, well, hold on. Like you said, MOA is much more fine than mill. When you're shooting at number eight limestone at a thousand yards, quarter MOA still isn't fine enough, which is why some shooters use eighth MOA. I would never sacrifice a chance to be more precise. Just so everybody knows, one mil is equal to 0.36 inches at 100 yards. Uh, quarter MOA is equal to 0.25, eighth is 1.25. All right, folks, that is steeped in, in nonsense, in, in complete misconception. And I, again, I thought this was long range 101, universally understood, uh, or I would have, um, you know, I would have talked more about that in the last video. I just thought people understood this concept right here. The precision of a rifle is predicated on group size, nothing more. Not by how many clicks are in your optic or which system you use. I mean, folks, if I have an optic that is 1 50th mil, is it more precise? No, and it, that makes no sense. And we'll talk about that more too. The fidelity in which you can move any impact can only be as fine as your group size at any distance. So understand that. The fidelity in which you can move any impact can only be as fine as your group size at any distance. And I'll, I'll show you an example of that. The other thing that you need to understand is that just because a rifle can shoot one MOA at 100 yards, it is not going to shoot. You cannot expect it to shoot one MOA at all distances. Outside of environmental variables, so you know, so for instance, if we're shooting inside of a tunnel and we have control of the environment in that, the density altitude is the exact same, there's no wind, no nothing. Even if we were able to do that and we shoot a group of one inch at 100 yards, folks, your group size will not be five inches at 500 yards. The micro differences in projectile variability dramatically degrade precision over distance. I don't know, you know if there's a constant just based on knowing the, those small variables, but the reality, I'm sure Brian Litz may be able to answer that. But the fact of the matter is, is that just because you shoot one inch or a half an inch at 100 yards, doesn't mean you're gonna shoot a half an inch for very much longer, right? Your group is going to open up. The accuracy of your gun is going to degrade over distance because of those micro variables between shot to shot, that the condition of your gun, the micro differences in powder, the micro differences in temperature, uh, the cleanliness of your gun, the fouliness in your gun, um, all of those things. And those little changes start to show up at greater distances. It's just a fact. All right, so what determines a rifle's precision? The least precise component in the precision rifle system. That's what determines a rifle. So what I mean by that is the system consists of the shooter, the rifle, and the ammunition. 
So if we have a shooter that is a .75 MOA shooter, the rifle's a .5 MOA gun, and our ammunition is 1.25, the best groups that we can ever get is 1.25 MOA at 100 yards. That's just a fact. So here's what we need to understand with that in mind. We have constraints of impact adjustment. So this right here is a group. We have a one inch, that circle represents one inch. And we shoot a five round group. This is the best we can do. And we're exactly within, basically within one inch. So we have a one inch shot group or a one MOA five round group at 100 yards. So we've grouped, we can even say that we've zeroed. Now we shoot at another target and we are one eighth MOA essentially off of center. Well, you know, I have, I happen to have a scope that dials one eighth of MOA. So I'm going to make that adjustment. All right. And now I'm going to shoot at another target, but because I have a gun that can only shoot within one MOA, boom, this is what your, your shot group is going to look like. It doesn't matter how you, you, your, your optic can be graduated in one thousandths of MOA. It doesn't really matter. All you can do is move a group mechanically. You can't move those individual shots reliably. So the size of your group determines the absolute fidelity of your ability to move and impact reliably. That's it. So here's a better example. Right here we have a five inch gong. This gong is five inches at 500 yards. So it's a one MOA target. That's what we're shooting at. Now I put my optic on there and here that red dotted line there, that is, we'll say again, that's our optic, that's our uh, that's our group size, or for this instance, we'll just say it's our impact zone. This is the impact zone. Our gun's a one MOA gun, so we could shoot 100 rounds, and if we did everything that we were supposed to, and the gun was still good, all of those rounds would reliably end up within that impact zone, all of them. So we shoot, boom, we got one round impact over there. We shoot again, happen to group right over there. We know that half of this target is 2.5 inches or half an MOA. And we're like, you know what? I'd really like to get center mass of that thing, but I don't understand the limitations of what my gun can do. So I happen to have a scope that will dial 0.25. So I got two clicks. I go two clicks to the right. And all I've done is I've moved my impact zone 0.5 MOA to the right. And this is what ends up happening. We squeeze the trigger, boom. We squeeze the trigger again, boom. We squeeze the trigger again, boom. All right, I mean, that right there is the limit of the fidelity that we can move one round at a time when we have a one inch shot group. If that's all your gun shoots. So, you know, you need to understand that. Unless you can shoot 0.25 groups at 100 yards, eighth MOA adjustments are absolutely pointless. You can't move individual impacts only your group or your impact zone. Just because you're shooting 0.25 MOA at 100 yards, rest assured you are not shooting 0.25 MOA at 500 yards. On mil, a tenth of mil adjustment is 0.36 MOA. It is more than fine enough for anything outside of the F-Class. Folks, so the point here, folks, is that MOA is finer of a scale. There's no doubt about it. But it is not more precise because if we talk about precision, and I know there's a difference between the, the definition of precision and accuracy, but essentially we are talking about accuracy. We're talking about the ability to reliably put around where we want it. And if you don't understand the constraints of your ability to move your impact zone, you can't move individual rounds, it is what it is. Now, going back to F-Class, folks, those guys have the guns, have the time that and, and the in, inordinate amount of time and money they put into reloading and everything they do, super specialized, super expensive. It is a, a super specialized class of shooting. Those guys are actually shooting 0.125 MOA. So it makes sense that they would have eighth MOA uh, adjustments. It, that makes sense. You, however, are not. Um, and you are not going to be shooting at a, a, a fidelity greater than or finer than 0.36 MOA past like 300 yards. So the point here is, is that, you know, sure, here we have a micrometer. This is more precise than another form of measurement. But if we're doing carpentry work, is this actually more precise or more efficient than using a measuring tape? Absolutely not. So it's about choosing the right tool for the right job. And MOA falls flat on that. And I don't, you can, you can make your optics 
in one hundredths of m away. It doesn't mean that you can move your impact one hundredth m away, and definitely not be able to do it at distances. All right, folks. So hopefully that was helpful. Hopefully that was informative. I'm sure I didn't explain some of that well. I'm sure I left some things out. Um, I'm sure you guys have some arguments for MOA that I didn't address here. As a matter of fact, while I'm thinking about it, some people make a case for mill or MOA uh, for range estimation. Um, I, I would actually say, folks, and I'll, I'm throwing you a bone here, range estimation for MOA for American shooters is probably easier. But with that being said, most of us are lazy in targets anyhow, and you can do it just as easily with mill as well. So I, I do think on those, we're fairly even. Maybe a little bit of an advantage going toward MOA for the average American shooter that is you know, measuring things in yards and inches. So take that for what it's worth. But I'm sure there's some other arguments that I, I didn't address. But speaking of F-class shooters, we're actually gonna have Eric Cortina on our podcast live right here on YouTube and Rumble. Uh, at, it'll be July 26th at 7 p.m. So I plan on posting this video the morning of July 26th, so make sure you come watch that live. But uh, you're welcome to, if you even see this in the future, you can go back, we'll have it posted. You can go back and watch it, um, even though it's not live. But make sure you're joining us every Wednesday at 7 p.m. Eastern time, uh, right here on YouTube and Rumble for our Live Dangerous Liberty podcast where we talk about guns, gear, training, politics. We have special guests on all the time. We'd love to have you join us. And uh, again, you know, while guns and gear is great, what we're really about is training. So make sure you go to ParamountTactical.com. Go check out our upcoming training schedule. We'd love to have you out. We'd love to meet you in person. We have long range courses, tactical carbine, handgun, medical courses. Most of our instructors are former special operations. All of them have operational experience and instructional experience. And make sure you go to our website, ParamountTactical.com, where the only gear we carry are items that we have personally tested and we believe in. Well, folks, make sure you like, subscribe, throw some comments down below. Tell me why I'm wrong. Um, and if you like content like this, you know, subscribe. We really like to have you. And make sure you go watch us on Rumble. Make sure you like, subscribe, share all this stuff because we're trying to get the message out, but we're moving everything over to Rumble and we're trying to bring as many people with us as possible. So still like, subscribe here, but go watch us on Rumble because YouTube is not a friend of the First Amendment or the Second Amendment, uh, and it is what it is. But until next time, stay armed, stay ready. We'll talk to you soon.